Well, hello, um, Steve hello. and Noah. How are you do, doing? Hello. Outside Very of the well. room. How are you doing? I'm all right. Now, who has the big picture of a cat behind them? Uh, that would be Noah. Uh, so, uh, as you see, we have cats peppered throughout our talk, and um, that's my cat, Poppy. Oh, and she's took lovely. From, um, so from James Snell talk, where he had his 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 latest dog up there. So. Yes, he's one of his five dogs, so don't forget he's got so many dogs now. <laughs> yeah, we, I have four cats and a dog, so I can relate to James. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Steve? Have you got any animals who are going to be making an appearance during your talk? I, I'm hoping my cat does not make an appearance, uh, although you may hear him, but uh, he shouldn't make an appearance on cam today. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've been very lucky that my cat Ace hasn't managed to get into my room so far during this conference because he just howls at everything. So, and he likes to sit in front of the camera. So that would have been interesting, but I think he's he's found himself a new place to hide for the last couple of days. So um, you're a loosely coupled pair of speakers, um, and the the only pair we've had presenting. So it's it's a uh, it's great to have you both here. And I'm going to hand over to both of you now to talk about loosely coupled micro front ends at Capital One. Thank you. So we wanted to go ahead. Thank the audience, first of all, for attending this session. Can you not see my screen? Oh, there it goes. Thanks for attending this session. Uh, we really wanted to thank the folks at, at Nearform uh, for inviting us. They've been nothing but supportive of me and Steve, as well as the other presenters here. We're really humbled by the opportunity to present here. Uh, this is the first time we've delivered this talk at a conference. And for us, it will be a challenge. Uh, this platform we're going to discuss has been a product in years of efforts carried out by hundreds of talented software engineers at Capital One, as well as us drawing from some of the best ideas in open source. And all the credit goes to those individuals. Any mistakes or failures are, are strictly mine and Steve. Uh, this is a case study uh, around micro front ends and Node. I think that there's nothing new in it, so to speak, but our work validates that these ideas scale well, even in a highly regulated industry in a large financial institution that capital needs. Awesome. Uh, I'm Steve Usak. I'm a distinguished engineer at Capital One. I've been here since 2014, working in our contact, contact center uh, software space. Um, <clears throat> my expertise in this area and at Capital One has been around greenfield architectures using Node.js, sound engineering principles, and uh, using uh, having easy to use developer experiences. Yeah. And I'm Noah Mandelbaum. Uh, I'm a distinguished engineer at Capital One. I joined Capital One in 2012. Um, my specialties are architecture, AWS, and technical teamwork. Uh, so a little disclaimer about this talk, uh, you will see a lot of cats in the presentation. As we kind of mentioned up front, we, we love cats. We have a lot of cats, including dogs. Uh, we like cats and, and that is all. So our agenda for our talk, we're gonna really hit three key points. Uh, we're gonna talk about our journey from a monolithic architecture to a microservices everything architecture. We're gonna talk some about high, level implementation details along the way about AWS, microservices, and micro front ends, and then some lessons in particular we learned along the way about JavaScript and uh, Node.js. So let's get started. So our monolith emerged in the, the late aughts. Uh, we built it pretty quickly. We had to replace an older uh, contact center system, uh, basically the system by which uh, Capital One interacts with anybody who has a question about the cards. Um, the new system had to support up to 20,000 contact center associates to help customers. Uh, 
it had to uphold high levels of security and regulatory compliance as well. Uh, this system would support anything from a question about a payment to a fraud concern to a billing concern to a change of address, you name it, it had to support it. So like a lot of companies at the time, uh, we chose server side mostly. So we used uh, .NET Web Forms, ASP.NET, C Sharp running on Windows Server. Just about everything was server side. There was a little bit of uh, client side JavaScript, a little bit of jQuery and libraries. For us, it was probably the right architecture at this particular moment in time. We had a goal we needed to reach and for Capital One, we reached it in record time. The customers who called in, they really knew no different. And the people who had to do the work with their system could do their job. But as we got into the 2010s, um, problems began to emerge. So we had 100 plus on-premises servers to manage with this very large system. And we would sometimes do code deployments and the code would work exactly as it did in QA on 95 of the servers. But because of configuration drift on the other five servers, we'd see slight differences. And this was very painful to figure out. Uh, builds took a full day and a, a full team to do them. And testing took days and had to span many teams. Uh, we had scripts, but we also had manual steps in there as well. Uh, because these processes were creating so much friction, a large sets of changes went in all at once. Uh, we'd have one or two releases a month with hundreds of changes in them from across the spectrum of the business. Uh, the application was stateful and therefore fault tolerance was suboptimal. If a user ran into a problem, a lot of times what we end up doing is telling them to go ahead and clear their cache or clear their cookies, hope for the best. Uh, observability was really consistent of logs at that time. And so we either have these finely grained kind of logs that had way too much detail for any human to understand or too little detail to be of any use. And of course, when you're talking about a multi-million line code base, uh, we found it very difficult to back out mistakes. But even when you move beyond that, there's organizational challenges when you have hundreds of code uh, software engineers contributing to a single code base, to a monolith, and you don't have the tooling that, say, a Google has. So merge conflicts could be very difficult, especially if it was between teams who are across time zones or across lines of businesses. And even beyond that, our product folks, our different lines of businesses often had different release requirements around timing and um, freezes. So for example, you can imagine the payments team might wanna do their releases every third week on a Saturday, and the rewards team might wanna do their releases every fourth week on a Sunday. In order to get these releases kind of out and consistent with these hundreds of changes, they had to do a complex negotiation. Most of all, for the people who are frontline agents, the people taking those calls, we want them to be able to do their job better and we want to make things easy for them. But if a bug was discovered because of all the friction in the system, it often would take a month or more just to get that, those issues resolved. And process improvements took even longer because they involved complex coordination across the lines of, of businesses. So the system worked initially, but it didn't quite get us what we wanted. The good thing is that as we got into the 2010s, as you all recall, good things were in the air. So around 2012, uh, Capital One began to embrace microservices internally. They had had kind of gateways before, but we centralized behind a, an API gateway. And so you began to see those APIs, those REST services blooming. Uh, in 2013, Capital One had also started their public cloud journey with uh, AWS. And so talking about configuration drift, it kind of held out the possibility that we could replace our pet infrastructure with cattle, with pieces that if you had configuration drift, you could destroy and rebuild. 2014 and 2015, the software engineers, among them Steve and myself, began to look at, uh, look at single page application frameworks, things like Angular and Ember and other things. And we learned a lot more about Node.js. We really dove into that with a lot of enthusiasm. And then 2016, uh, there's a lot of things floating around, but uh, ThoughtWorks talked about published in their technology radar about micro front ends, and we recognize that this sort of approach might actually help us, considering our organizational structure being that it was following Conway's law. These ideas gave us hope. Could we have any time releases, any where hosting, and any who ownership? Uh, can we break apart that multi-million line code base into something that was smaller and simpler, so our developers could be more focused? on delivering business intent and less focused on the toil associated with build, deploying, and running these systems. Um, 
So we limit uh, failure blast radius. So when you have an enormous monolith like this, little code piece over here can cause a failure over here. And any time you reach uh, that place, it was pretty bad. Uh, and can we give our software engineers room to innovate within guardrails? We knew we needed to have con contracts. We needed that we need to know that you know the system would appear to be one thing to our users, but we wanted freedom to iterate and grow. Um, it wasn't straightforward, but we did get there, and that's why we're talking today. We didn't really know what we were doing up front. Uh, when we were giving this talk internally, somebody said, we just had five major pivots. Uh, there was actually a lot more minor pivots along the way, but what we had to do is iterate and discard ineffective models. At the same time, we had to maintain that large legacy contact center application. So we were working in the scene, we were trying to strangle it off. Our product managers were supportive, which was great, but they wanted more. They wanted a reinvention of their process, and they wanted things to ultimately be simpler for, for everybody. So we got there, and Steve will be talking a little bit more about the technical details in his portion of the presentation. We had to lay down some necessary foundation in order to make a go of it, though. So I think when you're dealing at the scale that we're dealing at, you have to have that mixture of architecture, code, and governance to make it successful. You have to be pretty diligent about automation, and you have to get advice and read from the best in open source, right? So one thing that we did is we went ahead and created a single unifying design system out of web components to create the illusion of a single application. Uh, this made the fact that the application behind the scenes was broken up into little bits less consequential, and it also allowed us to do things like be ADA compliant for our users. Uh, even though we have hundreds of deployments, we had to come up with a standard CI-CD pipeline because, again, we had a lot of friction around testing and building and deploying. And what we did is we came up with a common pipeline we could use that would take you all the way from PRs to QAs to performance testing, uh, to checking out uh, licensing, to checking security, to getting into production. Only requires today one approval from a product manager to go out. Uh, not going to get into domain-driven design here because we don't have time, but it's really important or was really important for us to go ahead and come up with a, a domain model that we can use to make sure that uh, we were properly modulized from a business point of view, from a technical point of view, and also to make sure the right teams were right, working on the right intent. So other things that were key for us, we realized and iterated our way into an open governance knowledge sharing process. Good documentation, lots of Slack, a single Slack group or set of Slack groups to share information, and a weekly meeting among all the contributors on the platform to see what's going well, what's not going well, and to offer improvements, kind of inner sourcing. We do also learn, we also learn that we need to constantly survey our software engineers and users about their experience and take that feedback seriously and improve. That feedback can be good or bad or indifferent, but they are your true source of knowledge. So what we have today is a micro front end approach. Uh, it's orchestrated by an app shell. We have about 100, we have 100 plus applications uh, that are orchestrated here. Similar number of independent Node.js microservices. We have up to 50 teams working on our platform at a time, and they can release at any time. Uh, the failures are isolated. Again, we're able to get rid of that blast radius by being modular. 100% cloud native, and then best of all for our users, bugs can frequently be resolved in hours without heroics versus months, and we can still have our coffee and get home on time. Steve? Thanks, Noah. Um, so <clears throat> Noah mentioned the app shell, and I'm gonna go into a little bit a little bit more detail here. Um, not that much detail yet, Noah. Uh, <laughs> an app shell. Uh, so our app shell is the overall application is composed at runtime through our shell. Um, our end users, which are our call center agents that are helping the customers, they see one application. Uh, although the composition in the browser can be made up of uh, four to five micro apps at any one time, Time. Our shell router <clears throat> handles the basic page composition based on a specific URL pattern, uh, which I'll get to shortly, and some configuration. Uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, an Nginx reverse proxy brings together the application under one domain to deal with obviously things like cores issues, but also allows us a much more flexible hosting strategy for the many applications behind it. 
Um, <clears throat> we follow a traditional three-tier architecture with our client being the browser, our business layer, our orchestration layers, and our data layer, our, our, our enterprise APIs or databases. These, the orchestration layers are specifically tuned APIs that utilize multiple um, enterprise APIs for data coordination for the front end. So all these are typically Node.js processes. However, they can be Lambda-based or languages other than Node, but we are a Node shop, so we are using Node in most of these cases. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, we do use a lot of popular open open source libraries, such as Fastify, Pino, uh, Vue, and uh, Jest, and things like that. So next I'll go into the structure of our URL, which is central to how we uh, route throughout our system. So you can see there, it's made up of five different components. The first one is what we call a mode, and this basically just tells our router what system, uh, tells the shell router the system uh, configuration to use for our page composition. You can almost think of this as a tenant type of thing. Uh, the domain, this is just uh, an organizational concept to keep things uh, segmented. Um, so it's an opaque organizational unit, like a business domain. So in our case, this could be things like credit cards, uh, bank, uh, auto and and others. Um, a container is a grouping of coarse grain functionality. So th an example here would be like our payments functionality or or our rewards functionality. Within that container, I can have one or more apps of the micro UIs. And so for payments, you can think of one app might be make a payment. Another app might be added deb debit card for my payment options. Um, after that, you have the actual micro app itself and obviously the resources um, that are required for the application. And this would be your, your JavaScript, your styles, uh, images, or whatnot. So as we move to the next slide, you'll see that uh, the configuration uh, keeps our page composition flexible. We have two modes here. We have servicing and quality. Uh, <clears throat> there is a required uh, portion of our page composition, and that's what we call the landing page. And you can think of the landing page as basically the index HTML for the entire application. And it's the main entry point into the experience. And it usually this lands at a place where our customers, are, I'm sorry, our agents, our users can uh, do a search or use some tile-based navigation or see some other information. Other parts of the page are basically optional. So you, if you look at the configuration here on the left, you can see that the difference between servicing and quality is that servicing has chosen to uh, implement all the outlets on the page, whereas quality is only doing the header and obviously the required landing page. Um, every micro app component that you see maps to an HTML div element called an outlet, and our shell router then brings it all together at runtime when the page is loaded. And next slide, we'll see an actual um, page. Um, this is not a real application, obviously, uh, it's a sample. Um, so our sample application here shows five running things. We have our shell, which is basically the browser frame, and our shell provides the common services like our user authentication, the routing I previously mentioned, our client-side logging and forwarding and configuration management and a few other services. At the top of the page, you see the header. At the bottom, you see the footer in purple. On the right-hand side, we have uh, what we call our sidebar, which is hot pink. And then in the middle is our application. Most of the time when running the app, running the entire application, the only thing that really changes is the orange box there. We swap in and out as the user uses the system. So as they use the system and navigate between our micro apps, the main shell router is the router that is in use. So we have a router object on the window and that allows us to swap in and out applications as the user navigates. When I'm inside an actual application itself, such as payments um, or rewards, the, the native router of that application is what is in use. So for example, if the application here in orange is a React app, I would be using the React router at that time. Communication between our micro apps is very loosely coupled. We use IDs basically only, and that happens via Redux store so that all the applications can react on changes. However, each app, 
being independent of each other is responsible for rehydrating its data on its own. So in hosting this in AWS, an Nginx router brings it all together. So here you see the same page on the left-hand side uh, coming into our main Route 53 and then hitting our Nginx reverse proxies. Those reverse proxies are the key to breaking down the routing structure that I introduced before. And it uses this to determine where to go for each individual component of the application. So it also handles some caching. Um, so what you can see here is this allows us to host and uh, deploy our, our application components in, in different technologies within the cloud. So here you can see, uh, for example, the shell might be hosted in ECS, our header and footer in EKS, the application itself in Lambda, or the sidebar in Fargate. You can also imagine things like S3 or CloudFront could be used as well. So next I'll get into some of the lessons we've learned along the way um, and have helped us evolve our platform to where it is today. So the first part is, uh, if you recall the, the, the hosting there in the AWS, would be how would our developers even work in this, this type of atmosphere? So previously, when we had the monolith, we required our developers to build and deploy locally on their machines using IIS server running locally. That meant a lot of IIS resets, obviously, along the way. Um, as we retooled and re-envisioned our architecture, we looked at using Docker containers uh, deployed on our local machines. Um, we loved it. And the reason we liked it is it mimicked exactly what we had in production. We also hated have a developer proxy, which actually proxies our entire system across to different uh, Node.js processes or Webpack dev servers. This allows our developers to only have on their local machine what, they, what they're actually working on, and anything else that they aren't working on can be off box and proxied through that developer proxy. So the next thing is, and kind of goes along with our developer experience is um, proactively refactoring. Um, we also reactively refactor, <laughs> and I'll get to that in a second too. Uh, staying on the same modules or versions can lead to security issues, lack of performance gains, and, and that kind of thing. And so also it, it, it stagnates the te te technology in the end. So a good example here is Restify versus Fastify. We started on Restify several years ago and it's worked great for us. However, as advancements in Node.js and the ecosystem in general have made modules like Fastify much better for our use case as it and us have matured. Um, as you know, deprecations happen by force and um, by necessity. One example here is the request module. We all know that that was deprecated years ago. And so we have to refactor into the newer uh, HTTP clients like um, Yundichi and others, Axios and NodeFetch and things like that. And then lastly, our testing frameworks uh, have become easier over the years. We started in uh, strictly Mocha, Shinon, and Chai, um, but with, uh, just coming to the forefront, we have moved to Jest. That makes it much easier for our developers in the end. The next thing is um, we learned quickly or early, I guess you could say, uh, that JavaScript is not immune to memory leaks. Um, we needed to be more careful in learning and dealing with our closures, our unhandled exceptions and variable scoping and, and some nuances of, of JavaScript in general. Um, we found that using uh, observability software to find patterns of these memory leaks and things have been instrumental in helping us keep them down or at bay. Um, we've also learned that training all of our developers, not just uh, not just a single set of developers or operations, but having all your developers be uh, uh, trained in the software of how to read and diagnose these issues is very important. We also worked uh, uh, to get our developers training on Clinic.js uh, by Nearform. 
And we have found that to be one of our best in breed software tools to help us find these types of issues earlier and avoid issues when it, uh, before they even get to prod. So through our performance testing, endurance testing, and, and, and other testing. The next lesson, which kind of goes along with the uh, memory leaks, is uh, avoid breaking our promises. So learning the correct usage of promises, the correct usage of async wake was, was a very important step for us and our developers. Uh, James Schnell broken promises video enlightened us to things we didn't even anticipate. Um, we've had we had a couple mysterious behaviors and after going through that workshop and training uh they were clarified for us so <clears throat> in fixing those we also implemented the make promises safe library that mateo colina has published and this helps keeps us honest in our unhandling exceptions and uh uh, helps us get those issues uh, fixed earlier rather than later to avoid the memory leaks and, and mysterious behaviors if you're not handling that stuff correctly. The last, um, and we're still learning obviously, but the, not last, the last major learning is learning to not block the event loop. So again, observ observability tools uh, give us the insight into the Node.js event loop and are extremely valuable in helping in this area. Um, we actually uh, had an issue with regexes and caused a redos attack on ourselves using regular expression denial services. Um, and this was related to catastrophic backtracking through regexes. Uh, from this, we learned to check that all, check all of our regexes and make sure that they are broken into the smallest, simplest regexes as possible. And then using tools like safe regex to find issues uh, that could cause catastrophic backtracking. Obviously, regexes aren't the only thing that can block your event loop. Anytime JavaScript is running, uh, you have a potential to block the event loop in Node if you aren't safe. So uh, again, the point here being our observability tools help us find these issues uh, earlier rather than in production. So coming to our final, final notes here on our journey, uh, it took us a few starts and stops to get to this point. We are always looking for uh, ways to improve key parts of our platform and the methodologies we use. We are heavily invested in making sure we have the correct amount of observability throughout our system uh, to help move us more, even more towards proactive versus reactive troubleshooting. And this is key not only to our developers, but our operation partners as well. We can't go down and affect the delivery of our servicing to our, our end user customers. Um, Finally, we are looking for ways to expand the usage of our platform into um, some other domains as well. We feel our platform model excels when you have many different individual teams working to produce one main application, allowing those teams to deliver their specific functionality how and when they want. And that's it. So any questions? Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, my favorite thing on there is that there is no victory count, but I will make it my mission to try and find you one. So um, brilliant use of cats. Um, also great to hear that you're using Clinic.js and you're getting on so well with it. Um, do you want to just give us a little bit about um, how you got involved with that? How did you find out about it? I'm sorry, I missed the first no, part of that. About, about Clinic JS. Oh, Clinic JS. So, yeah, yes. Yash, yes. Uh, so go ahead, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had um, a memory leak and we were searching for tools or any way we could get insight into what was happening. And um, we had been in contact with Nearform for some, for some other things and uh, was pointed to the Clinic tools as part of that and um, found the videos and everything and learned how to use them. Um, it was, a, a, we've just had found it immensely valuable uh, to just get the insights into everything with, the, with Bubble Graph, with Doctor and, and everything like that. Anything you wanna add, Noah? No, I, I think that, I mean, one of the things that we found is that, you know, it started originally probably with, uh, we had gone to uh, JSConf or NodeConf a few years ago, and we'd seen Mateo present, and then Steve and I had actually seen James present his Broken Promises workshop at one of these conferences, 
and we uh, we just began to follow kind of near forms trajectory very and James's and Matea's trajectory very carefully. We found that to be very instructive in our environment. Brilliant. Um, I've got some questions here from the audience. So, um, uh, sorry, somebody just said it was a great talk, and they just wanted you to know that as well. But what a what a, Oliver says. What are the disadvantages of using Docker? That's a good question. That's a um, that I don't. The disadvantages that I see, and these are my own views, most likely here. <laughs> um, Running it all locally, uh, especially comprising a big application through containers, uh, can be quite taxing on your local system. As such, you have a lot of, like when you go to mimic that in a Kubernetes pod or in ECS or Fargate, you're going to be deploying a lot. And so a downside to the is the granularity in which you could get to for your microservices, which isn't a big deal. It, it does help keep you uh, uh, more scalable in, in certain areas and keep and, and reduce the blast radius of issues. But it, it can become a little cumbersome with uh, maintenance over time. No, yeah. way. you want to add? Yeah, I, I would add as well. I mean, you have some interesting choices in this space and they, we could talk a long time about it. But for example, in the AWS environment, you can do ECS on EC2s, or you can do Fargate, or you can do Lambda, basically serverless versus using a server. And I, I think that a lot of times, you know, if you're using Docker and you're using it with a EC2s, then there's an operational tax that comes along with it versus going with serverless. Uh, and so there's another angle there where Docker, if used in a non-serverless manner, means that you're guaranteed a certain amount of maintenance. So that would be a disadvantage. Yeah, but, um, I'm also thinking back to the days of setting up a developer machine and then having to keep that up and maintaining it. It's, it you, you get some things back as well. So. Yeah, another, okay. uh, and I don't know if I highlighted it enough in the talk, with Docker running on your local machines, especially at a enterprise like Capital One, the machine differences between developers, just the setup is is hard. Uh, dealing with different networking, different proxies, different VPNs, just dealing with the developer settings themselves so that everybody looks like they're working the same, but sometimes you, you run into issues there too. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the work on my machine sort of issues. Um, exactly. Okay, I've got... A question from Matteo. Um, he says maybe he missed it, but the arc describe. Uh, but what was the architecture describe? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Maybe I missed that. But the architecture described was using mixed rendering. Both was it using mixed rendering? Was it using both server and client in the architecture? Um, currently, we are doing only client side rendering. Um, we have teams looking into server-side rendering at this point. Uh, we haven't uh, done that broadly yet. So right now, everything's uh, client-side rendered. Cool. This one's potentially related, so I'm just going to make it so I can read it. So Juan asks, how do you approach refactoring at scale when migrating from Restify to Fastify? That's a, that's a great question. So we are in the midst of that right now. Um, essentially, it comes down to prioritization talks with our product. We have seen um, that the benefits of moving to Fastify will give us an automatic performance increase, automatic TPS increase that we wouldn't get otherwise. And so it depends on the prioritization of the exact features and uh, components that we're looking at. But in terms of doing it en masse, it comes down to the individual, individual teams to choose when they want to do it, where essentially the platform itself is agnostic. And so we don't uh, prescribe anyone even being on Fastify or Restify. Um, it's by convenience mostly. Uh, so... Teams will move when they want to on this one. 
Um, and I think one thing that I didn't mention a little bit in some of the, the Node.js stuff, we have teams that use Nest.js um, instead of Fastify. They're, I think they're using Express even. And so we do have the flexibility that our teams can choose and uh, use the technology that are appropriate for them at that time. No, is there something we want to add? Yeah, I think the other thing is that, and it, it's kind of interesting, is that you know when you're talking about running you know platforms with lots and lots and lots of teams with lots and lots of product vendors, there's a cultural element to it. So what you have to do is you have to go out and socialize. You have to go out and repeat the message over and over again, uh, because the technical problems sometimes are the least of the challenges. It's just getting a, a group of people moving in a single direction. Yeah, I, I will add that for simple refactoring changes, we rely heavily on automation. And so we have tooling and we use things like um, things that will automatically do pull requests for the code to update dependencies. We, we have those types of things to do the minor refactorings, but the major ones we, we schedule and let the teams deal with as they need to. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one from, pardon me if I get your name wrong, Jul Ilian or Julian. Are you planning to release the main router code in any way or shape? Um, at this point, not currently planned. Um, we are still working on what that would mean for us. We do want to share, and this was our first attempt at sharing uh, our journey. And I think in the future, you'll see us starting to share some code and, and, and otherwise there. We have to go through, as a regulated industry, we, uh, we go through a lot of uh, uh, stuff around this, <laughs> I would say. And so um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to share soon some real live actual code. But one point to make is everything that, that we've done is based on things from the open source community. There's actually, um, very little, I mean, we do some tuning to it, obviously, to make it work for our case, but it is comprised of uh, a lot of things from the open source community. So I would add, I mean, for example, a lot of the ideas that we are pursuing are certainly described pretty well in Michael Gear's book and blog posts on uh, micro front ends. Uh, as well, there's been presentations by Nearform and Dazen about this sort of thing. So I think one of the messages, you know, that we would give is that, hey, look, you know, these open source approaches, these ideas that have currency today, if you study them closely, there's nothing magical about them. They just happen to be very effective. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, that, that there is no secret source. You just have to work out how to, to work everything. So, yes. Um, so Peter asks, um, how many teams are we talking about at Capital One? So in our area, so we're focused strictly on the contact centering software. Uh, in our area, we are we have a core group of teams, and then we have the larger what we call our federated teams. Um, and total all up is about fifty teams contributing to this one application. And when I say one application, one application mode or tenant, and that is our call center software that our agents are using right now. So fifty teams, and typically our teams are about six to seven developers per team. Yeah. And, and they might have other responsibilities as well. Like they may also work on, on APIs. Um, and so, yeah, at that scale, a lot of it is cultural. A lot of it is making sure that you, you've communicated clearly, right? And well, there's a follow up on this. So when did you feel that the monolith was just becoming way too difficult? <laughs> um, when did we start it? Like 2010, so 2010 and a half. Uh, uh, it was real quick. <laughs> yeah, so what, what, what began to happen is we are, the, the pressure to deliver faster became higher and higher, and we could not, people are like, well, can you deliver twice a month? Yes, but now people are beginning to work nights and weekends. Can you deliver three times a month, right? And then, you know, there'll be occasions where, and Steve and I can certainly tell stories about this, where you would have an operational issue and we'd have to pull the lever and stop. And we would swarm into the night eating pizza, right? Hoping that we could get this resolved. Um, and it, 
it became clear that the cost of owning this monolith was going to far outstrip the, the cost of building it. And you were also costing people, right, who would leave out of frustration. So it was pretty important from a number of different angles to, to tear it apart. And so we began looking. This is a, Steve arrived a little bit later than I did. But when in, I arrived in 2012, in 2013, we were already talking about, well, how can we tear this thing apart, you know? Yeah, and I, I would add that um, it was successful. The monolith wasn't bad. The processing and the, the weight of it started to become cumbersome. So everything worked great. Our, our customers were happy. Um, yeah, we had you know little uh, hiccups here and there, but in general, it, it has served us well for, for many, many, many years. And the opportunity to redo it in a way that makes it even more flexible and uh, better for our operations, our developers, and eventually our customers is, is the reason we, we went away from it. Yeah, I can, I can relate them. It's not trivial. It's not trivial at all. No, um, I, I think there's a talk from 2018 by somebody called Katie Stockton Roberts about um, strangling monoliths. Um, I did something back here about what we did at the BBC. So it, I, I completely recognize what you're talking about here. And half of the time you are trying to replicate stuff but you can't innovate on a monolith. It's so difficult to, to, to push changes in because it does a job, it does it incredibly well, but it's so difficult to move it because it's huge. So I, I've got one more question for you from, this is gonna be a challenging name to me, so I do apologize if I get it wrong, Zbyski. And are there any means of communication between micro apps other than the Redux store update? So for our current um, architecture is we use that Redux store as, as our current mechanism. Um, we have seen patterns, but we don't employ them that use a lot of event-based uh, uh, communication. Um, if we're communicating between applications, we feel in our architecture that that is not sustainable. So um, the communication is very, like I said, very loosely coupled. So the, uh, the only way to communicate is through an ID-based system. So for example, if I'm working on a, a customer that has multiple accounts, those each one of those accounts has an ID. If in the header, I switch that account from, let's say my Quicksaver card to my Saver, to <laughs> Quicksilver card to my, let's say Venture card, um, every application that's on the screen is listening to that account change and then they will rehydrate their data as needed. We don't want to project the data across the apps and have them depend on one another for that. So they all look at the store uh, centrally for that data. Brilliant. But yes, there are, Thank other, you guys. There are other mechanisms. Yeah. Thank you guys ever so much for the talk. It's been incredibly interesting. There's a lot of uh, praise and, and thanks on the um, channel chat channel as well. If people want to reach out to you, are you both available on Twitter or anything? Yeah, um, I think it's linked in the in the bios for the talk, right? Katie? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I will have to check. Um, but if not, could you just drop them into the chat chat channel so people have them? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We'll do that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to wave you off now. It's been a brilliant talk. Thank you. Oh, one at a time Thank on this you. one. <laughs>